It was a short version because I have a lot of things to say. I don't want to spend too much time just on that. So uh, here in my lessons, a lot of students ask, man, I don't really know what to do to start working on my guitar solo or my core melody. So I know we have a different, different levels here. Some of you guys have been playing solo guitar for, for a few years. And, but some of you is the first time. So I'm trying to cover a spectrum that goes from basic stuff to more advanced techniques that I I use that I have transcribed or that I just kind of, no, I don't want to say develop, but happen or st I start using it in my playing by doing some search, right? So the first thing that I really think about is what I call the three elements. So those three elements seems to be a little bit basic, but they are not necessarily as basic when you are in your arrangement. Not everybody's as aware of those three elements as you should, right? So the first one, of course, is the melody. And the melody needs to be heard, right? You need to be able to respect the phrasing. And also, the register plays a really big, important role. You've seen, like, sometimes when you transcribe guitar players, they transpose their melodies into different registers, right? So is because they are aware of where in the guitar those melodies sing better. So we need to be aware of that like singers or trombone players or saxophone players. And it's not just because we can play whatever key, we just start playing in the key that we see in the real book or even our favorite recording, because maybe our favorite recording is other instrument and we are translating that into the guitar. So it's good to think about the phrasing and, and that is gonna define the character of your tune. In the arrangement that I just played, I wanted to use like that kind of dark sound for this piece, but it's going to have a completely different personality if I do. Right? It's a completely different tune. You know, it feels completely different. So be aware of the register when you are playing the melodies. Always, but of course, in guitar, solo guitar setting, it's really important. So the second aspect is the chordal. And I'm not saying just chords, because we all know that chords, the definition is like more than three or more notes, you know, based on, on the triads. For me, in the guitar solo setting, the chordal element is whatever harmonic interval, right? It has also a personality in your arrangement. So I'm going to play a little bit of a tune, Prelude to a Kiss, and I'm going to use 
I'm going to play the melody, and I'm going to use it with some chords. I'm going to harmonize that melody. But I'm going to play it in a way that I'm not being super aware of those two elements. <laughs> That sounds good, that works, it's harmonized, but there's no like, the illusion that more than one thing or more than one thing's happening at the same time. By just being aware of those, I can do this. Right? It's not that the first one was wrong. A lot of people do that, but you create like a more 3D effect by doing that. and you combine with the other one, it's also good. But notice that just because I'm aware of that, a lot of things start happening, right? The third element is bass, right? So bass is really important, right? It clarifies the, the function of the chords, also the harmonic structure, of course. They create, create movement, right? And how they, do they create movement? An inversion, right? You play that chord in root position, or this, right? It is like this marker. I'm going to put it here. This, uh, this is an example for a teacher from back home. This being live streaming. He's seeing this. I don't want to look like I'm stealing this. So this is a chord in root position, right? This is a chord in inversion, right? Now it has movement, right? You understand that? Like, it starts going somewhere. So if you have this, it's a stable. But if you have this, sorry, it's not as stable as the other one. So you can use that resource for <coughs> your arrangements. In this tune, I use it. There's a, a moment in the tune that it does. Right, it's just F major. The melody is in the 13. And then it has the sharp 11. Right? You can do that, but adding inversions create the idea that there's more things going on. Right? So there's movement on that. There's other ways of creating movement with the bass, just adding a bass line, right? So if you think about creating like a counterpoint motion between the melody and your bass, there's an effect going on. Uh, you can also create arrangements that are based on the idea of, I did an example with melody and chords right now, or a few minutes ago. Now you can think about maybe just melody and bass, right? So I think everybody should be able to play their tunes, just bass and melody. It seems easy, but it's not as easy as you think. Or you can create an, an, an arrangement based on that. But you know, here, I'm just using those two elements, right? Bass and melody. And then you start adding a chord, the chordal element here and there. But it's not straightforward, right? So it's good to think about those. And also, it balances the texture. I'm going to go back to the prelude to a kiss, and you will hear it. That first bass root note that I place there, it kind of makes something in terms of arranging, right? It's, it's not just, just because I know the chords and I know all the shapes and I know all of them in root position, I'm just going to play that one. Maybe make decisions on when, when do you want to introduce that bass note, OK? So it's like having an orchestra, right? Sometimes you may have, there, there are arrangements that is just saxophone playing, crazy solis, and drums, right? It's not always the, the, the full band playing at the same time, right? OK, so you cannot talk about solo guitar without addressing uh, voicings. Um, so again, this is I'm trying to cover a big spectrum. So if there are some things here that you say, oh, man, I'm really good at that, maybe think about what Fred said last week. Reminders, right? It's good to have reminders on things. Um, I really appreciate that. So triads, right? Mm, last year, I talked about triads in terms of 
melodies and creating vocabulary, but I think they are super important also as, of course, harmonic structures that you should be able to place in the guitar very easily. So inversions through the neck, you should be able to play the inversions of major and minor triads of all keys easily in your instrument. And of course, also open triads. I'm gonna talk about those right now. So this is an example of, ah, this is not showing over, over time what I'm doing, okay. This is an example of triad, C major triad, in the neck with the melody on top in the first string. And you notice that you can have two versions of melody or two options for the melody. Here, this first inversion voicing, and I have the third on top, and now I have the fifth on top, right? So you can have the fifth on top, this is the second inversion, and you can have the root on top, right? You can have the root on top, and you can have the third on top. This is root position voicing, and it repeats, right? Being able to do that in all the strings, I think is super important with the melody on the first, second, and third string as minimum, right? So that's that example there. And open triads is basically the same concept, but you can start, you can approach it on the guitar by skipping the strings, right? So for example, if I do with the bass note in the fifth string, I'm not gonna use the fourth string, I'm gonna use just third, second, and first. So, right? Right? And you can do those combinations with the bass note in the sixth string, skipping the fifth and the fourth string, and you have just having the second and the first string. Different combinations, I think that's really important to do in all, with all keys, and with metronome, right? Some students, sometimes they are frustrated because it's a little bit boring, right? But what if you practice? You know, with patterns that you are working on, with different meters, I mean, creating like a nice environment for practicing and stuff. And you're also working in your time field and whatever other things that you need to work on. So don't just practice those voicings isolated, okay? Uh, drops, so I know a lot of people know them very well, but I'm also, something I get surprised because a lot of my students here at UNT and also in different parts over Skype lessons, I don't know why, but guitar players sometimes misunderstand the concept of drops. So I'm, I want to address that very quick. So basically, I'm gonna do an example with the drop two, but it's the same thing for do, drop two, drop three, whatever. So we have that voicing that if I try to play that in the guitar, it's super hard, right? Sounds good, but it's hard to play, right? Probably it's not gonna be your choice when you are playing with a three or a 200, right? It's hard to play. But as you notice there, ah, sorry. We have first, second, third, fourth notes or voices in our chord structure, right? It's not just the role that those notes, it's not the role that those notes play in the chord, right? It's just the first voice, the second voice, third voice, fourth voice. So I'm taking, or we are taking that second note, right in the voicings, and we are bringing it down. We are dropping that note one octave. And then we have this voicing that everybody plays all the time. So pretty much all the voicings that you play and that you know are drop two, right? And they come from a close wave position voicing, right? Because you want to respect that melody. So knowing those very well on the guitar, inversions of those is really important. And putting them in context. So two five ones at least. Um, I encourage all my students to be able to do this also in all keys, which is playing just the two five ones. I'm gonna play them right now without any upper structures, just the four notes of the, of the chord. Some of those voice of those chords are not the best ones that we're gonna use in our gigs, but it's the foundation, right? So, oh, sorry. Uh, right? Should be able to play those in all keys easily, starting with the melody in the second string as well. Right, um, the sixth string as well. And then you start adding colors. So I'm gonna do right now adding the ninth in all of those. So you will see, as David has mentioned before, that you start noticing that a chord that you understood as C 
now maybe it's an E minor or something like that, right? Because you are adding notes and you are not using the root, which is used for the bass player. So this is the, my D minor, which now looks as an F, mi F major, right? Major seven. Right, the C major, now it's an E minor. So do that. I mean, pretty much every student that I have had here at UNT, the first time that I asked them to do that, they cannot do it. So, you know, it's a reminder for everybody. Also for me, I, I practice this all the time. So practice that with drop threes as well with the melody, first, second, and third strings. It's really important. So, way close voicing. So those are the ones that we used, that I showed at the beginning as the main structure to having the drop twos or to understand the drop twos. But those are really, really cool in solo guitar settings and pretty much every time, right? Because they have like that kind of piano-like sound, right? I remember I, play, I was playing a gig in Dallas last year and somebody came to me and said like, man, what, play, what pedals are you using? And I'm exact, I always use just that. Mm -hmm. I don't have more pedals. This is what I have. I was like, man, I'm using this. Mm. It sounded like a piano, like a piano. You, you was playing. I started thinking about that. Why is he saying that? And then it's, I remember that we were playing like a Roy Allen, Roy, the Roy Allen tune, right? Roy Hargrove. And I was playing those type of voicings. So maybe that's why he has that idea that he was sounding as a piano. So those are really important. So when working on those, think on that. You, you conceive those from the top note going down, top to bottom. So for example, I have a B natural that I want to harmonize that as a D7 chord, right? So the top note is the 13, right? And then I go down and that, that, that 13 is replacing the fifth, right? You guys know that? In a four note voicing? Okay. So then if I go down, so it's fifth, then it's going to be the third, right? And then after the third is going to be the root, but I don't want to use the root, I want to use the ninth. And then after the, the root or the ninth is going to be the seventh, right? So it's this voicing, right? It's not this one, which is also beautiful, but this has different personality. You can also play with the bass, right? But this is a way close voicing. And so also learning those, playing two five ones with those, it's cool stuff and it sounds more modern and you're going to be able to give your solo guitar arrangement a different personality that just, right? So, way close voicings are super important and I use them today a lot uh, in this arrangement. Like, uh, yeah, well, maybe. That's a way close voicing, so think on those. So, more modern. Okay. For me, the, the way close voicing sounds super modern, but it's something more about the personality of the guitar. So, of course, chordal voicings, you know, uh, super important. The, they are associated with McCoy and all the stuff. For some reason, I don't know, they are not as cool in the guitar as some people are in the piano. You know, when somebody in piano does like, super hard to do. And just because we are moving, people, I don't know, visually has the impression that that's kind of easy to do, right? But when piano players do it, it's like, man, he's a genius, right? Uh, I don't know. But it's still, they are cool, and I use them all the time as well. So quartal voicings. And I suggest you guys to practice your modes with quartal voicings. So Ionian mode, I'm including the fourth here. And I feel a bit, little bit nervous with Noel here because he's an expert on this. But this is, this is, this is uh, Ionian voicing, right? Because I'm including the fourth in it. It's not just a one major voice. In <laughs> so being able to play, you know, all your voicing, your, uh, your chords in a mode with qu chordal voicings is important. With a melodic minor, you know, right? So it's, it's, it's a cool thing to do. Practice that uh, going through all different modes is, is a really important thing to do. Um, three note voicings. These are really cool and you need to 
I mean, it, as you can see there, they don't enhance the sound of the chord fully, right? They don't, they don't have all the notes of the chord that you need to address the sonority that is above them, right? But they work, right? If you are in a, with piano, maybe not in a straight ahead, you know, quartet, or maybe, I don't know, it's out of, it's, it's, you need to use your taste for that. But let's say that there is other person in the band like carrying the full sound of the voicing. Maybe you can go more in another direction and just do that, right? So this is a two, five, one just using three notes. I'm gonna play with the bass. Second one. I'm gonna do the first one more one more time. Right? So those work. Uh, this is another one. This is the third one. I like that. And it moves super easy in the guitar. Here we go, one more time. I don't know where is that one. Things like that. That's the fourth one. I know the fourth one is more dissonant. Here, I'm gonna play that one. Right? They move super easily, and I, I mean, what is what is really creating the idea of progression and two five one here is not that you have the, all the notes of the chord; it's the resolution and the voice leading, right? So that creates the idea of movement. Different chord, right? Being with that pedal for 20 years, I don't know how to <laughs> use it. <laughs> okay, so there's another chord. There's another chord. Just the, the very small movement is what is creating that idea of, of progression. So introductions. I think they are really important for every, every time you play. I don't know if you guys have been in uh, gigs when the band leaders say, like, play an introduction, and you just need to create something in the spot and, or with a singer. Can you give me an introduction? And you can play the verse of the tune if you know it, but you can also create something in the spot, right? Um, and of course, for your solo guitars are super important. I think they. I mean, they set the key of the tune, right? That's like the main reason of them. The standards have the verses, the sonatas have the preludes, you know, all that stuff. But mm, in your solo guitar arrangement, it's very different if you start your solo guitar arrangement like. And then you go, right? It's, there's no, they are not blending, right? So you need to, to be able to create something at the beginning that you can evolve into your tune and, and having that, you know, like that, that capacity. So if I'm doing something like that, and sorry if I make mistakes right now because I'm really improvising this. completely different tune and it's really important. So I consider introductions also a good lab for creativity, right? So this is the three ways I approach introductions. And I practice this, I, I, I have practiced this, so it's not just something that I come in, in the spot. So the first one is harmony bass, right? So these are the ones that singers wanna hear when you are very clear giving uh, harmonic material that presents the key of the tune and they can sing easily into the next chord, right? Or into the beginning of the tune. Um, they can use the material of the song, right? So if I'm playing prelude to a kiss. You know, that's 
it's the tune, and I can use it, but it's also good and it's very good for practicing to try to challenge yourself to create something different. So I'm not gonna show off here, it's just an exercise. So this tune is in C major. Who can give me just a random tune? Uh, uh, sorry, random note. Random note, this is C major. Hmm? The tune is C major, that's the key of the tune. Somebody give me just one note, single note. A, A okay. So I'm gonna use that as in my motif, right? <laughs> trying to use that and I, I force myself to always being able to get to the next point to make the, the introduction happen. So this was harmo harmony based. Um, prelude to a kiss, the B section is in E major. So maybe you can use that as an inspiration for, your, for the beginning of your tune. Uh, I'm gonna do it like with the concept of harmony bass. <laughs> find a way to go and then you, you are there, right? So you can use the material that the tune presents for your introduction, right? Uh, but also you can create your own as I just did. Melody based. So those ones, of course you can use the melody of the tune as I also did before in the other example. You can use material of the tune. So for example, this tune has that. So maybe I can use that as a motif. putting me in the spot doing that. But you can use elements of the tune to be inspired and create, uh, or the melody of the tune, and create something that is gonna set up not just the key of the tune, but the mood of your arrangement, or the mood you want the colleague to play, right? That's super important. It's not just one, two, uh, um, right? Uh, good. And you can also develop an improvised melody, right? That's really good for your, for your ears to maybe take the original material of the, mel of the tune as a starting point and create a new melody, right? I'm gonna do it again with this tune at the, with the end of the tune. Um. a melody there and then we can start right so I try to improvise also having a melody going on not just putting chord, chords that set the, the key of the tune um, texture bass these are the ones that I like the most I already play some things that are similar to that and I call it texture bass because that's the term I want to use uh, but it's based that on the idea of it can combine the the, 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 the two techniques that I mentioned before, right? They can have a real clear progression going on or a real clear melody going on, but maybe it's not gonna be homophonic. Maybe it's gonna be just counterpoint, right? In the, uh, or, or I'm gonna use like preconceived chord shapes, right? So.
like more the texture is is ambiguous, is creating some movement, is not just melody separate or harmony separate. Um, or something like more <laughs> Here is not the chord progression or the melody wh which is like leading my, my arrangement is like the personality of that sound that I'm trying to reach with open strings, with uh, seconds, sevens, things like that, you know? So it has more like a texture approach. That's the way I call it. Uh, okay, so introductions are super important. Use them. and. Also think on outros, where you, re, you go back to the information that you present in the introduction, is really cool. Other techniques, so uh, I'm gonna go, try to go fast through this, I don't wanna go very long, but uh, so the first one is inner voice movements, right? There are a lot of arrangements that have that in the tradition, of course, everybody's familiarized with it. Right on a minor chord, a major chord. I use it today. Uh, let me see. Here, right. That creates just movement into your arrangement again. The melody is just <laughs> or and right. So it's just pia for pianist. For pianist is super visual and maybe easier to use those, right? They have more fingers. But for us, we need to really think on those, like what I'm gonna do with that note that is gonna move, that note in my, in my chords. And you have a, an arrangement, it's, it's, you know, it's a little element that, that creates the, the sense of, arrange, uh, or an, of our, an arranging an arrangement, sorry, but but it's not that. It's just you are using a very common technique that everybody knows, but creates a special effect in your arrangement. Reharmonizations. Uh, I don't want to go very deep on function because you know you guys know that you know you can if you have the one chord you can uh, reharmonize with the six with the third all the stuff. Um, so it's important to, to be aware of those. Uh, David talk about, how do you call it, David? Bike, back cycling? Back cycling. Yeah, yeah so uh, that's really cool. Prelude to, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but I think it is. Prelude to a keys also has this. In the second half of the A section, you can do many things there. This is B, so you can have triton subs, you know. This is the one I don't love because it finished with the melody on top, fifth and fifth. So sometimes when I do that, like, how can I make that a little bit more interesting? Not having fifth, fifth, right? Uh, so if you invert the order of those chords, these are happening. So I'm gonna mention right now the top note in my voicing. This is 13, this is ninth. The previous time I went to E, so it was the natural nine on top. Now I'm gonna have nine, flat 13, right? Now I have flat nine, and flat nine, or flat nine and fifth in this case. So, right? So that bike cycling is, is very cool, uh, or at least including triton subs is, is, creates movement. It also goes along with that idea of creating movement in the bass note in the bass element. So that, that is important. Uh, by shape, and I don't wanna look like this is like a mediocre approach, but still, we are playing a guitar. It's an instrument that has a, a specific organization. Uh, so it has shapes, and even if we can use our intellect to create weird and really nice reharmonizations, we can also use the approach of shapes at what the instrument has to offer in order to create that. So sometimes I play this game and maybe the 89% of that is kind of garbage. 
but maybe there's 2% or 10% or 5% that is great, right? So I remember Davey always saying like, man, I don't want people to play the Hard Dream anymore <laughs> in this key, you know, you know? So what, what can you do without changing the actual key of the tune? Maybe just reharmonizations, right? And so I, I, I try sometimes to play tunes that I know well, just using like my hands, how they react to that, and play my, my hand there and making it happen. So for example, I'm really just making this happen right. Uh, let me see, one more time. That's from the tune, right? So I'm just using my hand. I'm, I'm not really thinking, okay, this is the flat six of this key and I'm going, I'm just using that resource. My hands can do it. Prelude to a keys. I know that tune goes there, right? It's an E and it fits this shape that I know very well, but it's not the one of the chord, right? So, you, I mean, I don't want to say trick people doing that, but it's a good resource that you can use to stimulate your creativity, right? So common note is pretty much the same principle or it's something that can help you to find that principle that I just mentioned is in this tune, we have the melody on the fifth, right? So try to play all the chords thinking on shape that have that note, the common note. a lot of them, right? So find one note in your arrangement and try to find chords that enhance that sound and maybe it's going to be something that you can continue developing through your arrangement without necessarily thinking that hard, without taking theory five or I don't know, you know, something like that. So use that, that resource. Uh, I use it all the time really and it's cool. And at least just for, for my own practice. Maybe not a lot in performance situations, but for my own practicing and developing things, I do it all the time. Counterpoint. So I, I talked a little bit about that before uh, in the texture based uh, type of introductions, but those are really important on solo guitar arrangements. Uh, going back to Dart and Dream, this is from Peter Bernstein, you know, when the tune does. There's one version because he has a lot of those that he plays. Just by doing that, he's creating a completely different texture. It's not just. Right? And it's the counterpoint is going there. You want to use seven, second, tritons. All those are welcome because if not, you're going to start sounding. So try to use the other type of intervals that are not from the classical tradition uh, and, of course, are more related to our, vocab to our language and you're going to find really cool stuff. So I also do that, like taking a tune and just using counterpoint. In my arrangement that I play today, I, do, I use it here. Right? So counterpoint is a really good resource for your solo guitar stuff. And I know I'm talking about a lot, a lot of ideas today. I'm not pretending like everybody go home and say like, yeah, I have all of those, but if there's just one little thing that is resonating after today and you have the handout as well, and you practice that one thing, I practice all those things all the time. It doesn't mean that because I'm presenting them, I'm decorated at all of those, but try to pick one from that list and work on them. That's what, that's what I expect from, from this lecture. Open strings, again, we are playing a guitar. I know we use voicings that may resemble the piano, and that's pretty cool, but the guitar, if you ask people what they think about guitar, they associate guitar with strumming, you know? I don't know this tune, but. That's 
that's what people understand about a uh, guitar. You know, they don't. This is our world. So sometimes I like blending those. You know, what people understand about this instrument and the elements that we have from the jazz school or jazz world, right? So today, my arrangement, I want to use that. Like, I want to use a lot of open strings. So I think you guys notice it. those open strings really bring personality to your instrument. I did an arrangement once, an arrangement once in yesterday's, so when it does... Uh, so I have these voicings that you see there. So this is the A7. So I always have in the B open string. So the B is always there, and if you notice, those voicings are almost impossible to play in the guitar without that resource, without having open strings. Are impossible. You, there's no shapes that you can do that if you don't use open strings. So it's really cool for that too. You know, finding sounds or sonorities that pretty much are unique to your own search. You know, um, so I'm gonna play one more time so you guys can hear it. of that B. And notice how the B is staying there, staying there, and resolves very smoothly in the same octave to the B flat. The only difference is that the B, the B flat I'm, is not an open string, right? So use open strings. Uh, in the arrangement that I just mentioned by Peter Bernstein on Darn That Dream, the next chord he plays is this, right? This is like a F7. Sharp nine, sharp eleven, with the root on top. You know, it's, it's, it's a really cool thing to investigate. Open strings, voicings, and again, try to go to the basics. You know, open string voicings. Uh, so two five ones with open string voicings. Uh, play a whole standard using the open strings that you can the most. You know, something like that. Try to be like methodical in your process, not just, hey, that's a, that's a cool voicing. I'm going to use it every time I get there, right? Try to, to create a method for yourself to use those. Long as. Pero todavía no. Yo le digo cuando. So this is another thing that I call it invertible melody. I don't know if this is the best term for this. Uh, it comes from, have you guys seen like sonatas or fugues, mostly fugues, they have one voice that enters, right? Then another vo voice imitates that, normally in the fifth. And then there's that same melody comes in in another voice in the same original key, and it works now in the bottom. So something that was working on the top, you can invert that and now it happens in the bottom, right? So I was always like, how can I use that in my own playing besides, I mean, compositions, you know, in my actual, performance and stuff. So I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to have the video here and the audio there, there in other device, so maybe they are going to be a little bit displaced. I'm going to tell you when to play the one. No yet. So notice that this is, this is a little fugue that I wrote. It is, it is from a class. No. OK. We are using the, we are using the, this is a handle motif, right? It's based on that. And you will see how the melody enters. Then it enters in the flute, and I want you to pay special attention when it comes back in the clarinet. Ah, okay. Sorry, sorry, no, you need to see it. Here we go. Technology. Uh, okay. Here we go.
right? So it's just very basic. But what I, what I wanted to, to, to present here is that idea that you have something that works on top, like being the melody, how you can use that uh, in the bottom without being an actual counterpoint. So I think that concept can, piano players do that all the time, but I don't see guitar players doing this really often. So again, going to Dart and Dream at the idea of how to make that sound better or different than the G major version that everybody plays all the time. So I'm gonna play the melody on the bottom and the voices are gonna be on top. And for these, open strings are, are a good resource as well. So. Right? So I'm gonna play one more time and try to hear it. One. Right? So you need to investigate in that. I wanna see the A minor one more time, sorry. Uh. Right? So you need to find your own shapes and try to make it happen, but it's a really cool resource that has been in music forever, right? Piano players do all the time. They are playing like voicings, like really strident voicings here in their right hand, and maybe they play the melody on their left hand. And maybe Stanley Jordan can do that, you know? But not like we with a normal approach, right? So try to think about that concept. I'm still working on it. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard, but I'm sure that you can develop cool stuff from, from using it. No more of that. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so basically, that's it. Um, and there's just one little thing that I mentioned. And this is also that things that students ask me when they are working on their, well, it's not working, but it's just the very last thing. Things that, um, how you harmonize certain chords, certain notes in certain chords. Sometimes it's kind of difficult, right? And again, I really love, I don't know if you know, I still have that in your door, the don't play this, right? So it's really challenging, actually, when you have the third on a melody on a dominant chord doing a solo guitar arrangement, right? So C, and you have this beautiful melody coming, and then you do. So there's very easy ways of solving that. The first one is, of course, adding the 13 instead of the five. And it's just by changing that little thing, it has personality and it's completely different. I always use that resource. And of course, you can do sharp five, sharp 11, right? And you don't have this anymore, right? Uh, I, I, <laughs> I agree with Noel. And I, I have had a lot of students that I say, don't play that chord anymore, really, because, I mean, you cannot find that, it's not Noel. You cannot really find that chord in, the, in, in jazz music. Like, what big band arrangement or piano arrangement has that type of voicing without a dominant chord without any type of color? It's really hard to find. So it really is like, sometimes I give this example. This is a, a rock song maybe you guys recognize. <laughs> That's crazy or amazing from Aerosmith by Aerosmith. I don't know, one of those. But it's just a typical example when pop musicians or rock musicians change the five for a minor four. If they play the five, the song will be like this. Right? That five chord is, is kind of out of or they voc their vocabulary, right? It's for me, I don't know, it's kind of, it's not part of what they, you normally hear in pop songs or rock songs, like a five follow or after the, the four chord, they normally use the minor four. In this era, right? I'm not talking about all pop in the world, but, right? So in jazz, sometimes these kind of things resemble that. When you play that chord, it, is, it feels like it belongs to other family. It's not part of our vocabulary. So that's a good way to solve that. If you are in a funk gig, maybe that's the chord. 
different contexts, right? So that's a good way to do it. When I have the, the fifth on a major chord, sometimes I avoid the third. And I know that's going to sound weird, but I don't love that sound. I avoid the third. I think that's enough. So that's another thing that I want to mention. Just um, maybe there are things that you've always been using, but sometimes it's good to go back and really revise why, why I play this voicing all the time. You know, maybe this is a better way of doing. I don't know. Right? So, pretty much chord tones in major or with in chords with major third, it could be dominant chord or major seven, are tricky for me. Like having the root, having the third, having the, the fifth on them, finding a nice voicing that, in, that enhances that sound is challenging. So, sometimes the way is taking some things out, as I do here. Right? So that basically said, uh, in your handout, you have a list of recordings that I think are good to mention. Some of them, Davey introduced me to some of those. It's not just things that I have listened by my own, but are really good recordings. Not all of them have solo, just solo guitar versions. Some of them have just introductions or the comping is great and you can use as a resource for your solo guitar. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? I mean, I don't know, we don't have too much time, but is there any question here? Somebody want to say something? We're good? Okay, good, thank you.